I'm now at Stripe where I am, you guessed it, building and running the design team. So um, super briefly about me, but speaking about Stripe, how many people here know what Stripe is? Oh, wow. I am uh, impressed for the, a couple of people who don't know. I'll give you a few headline facts. Uh, in, in a headline form, we, we say that we design and build economic infrastructure for the internet. That means that companies of all sizes and all shapes use our software to accept payments online and to operate their uh, sophisticated financial operations uh, in countries, more than 100 countries uh, around the world. Um, and a few uh, hopefully impressive stats. That's why they're there. Um, <laughs> Uh, outside stats, you may also know us from uh, what I think of wonderfully beautiful gradients and 12 degree stripes from all the stuff that we do. I see there are, there are some similar design elements here uh, somewhere. Way to go. All right. So th that's, uh, that's enough about the, uh, the facts. Um, so as I thought about what, uh, how to, to talk about this, uh, I figured uh, that I, I could divide my time in, in Stripe up to, uh, into a, a couple of different sort of eras, which roughly corresponds to uh, each of the years I've been there. I've been there about four years now. Uh, starting with uh, what I call getting to minimum viable team. Um, I'll get into more uh, detail uh, about what that is. Once we have a team, starting to think about specialization, specialization and adding more sort of sub-teams. Um, once we have that, making recruiting work like a machine so we can scale and grow. And once all of that, all of those things are working and we're firing on all cylinders. Then we can think what, what true scale is. 40 is, uh, trust me, uh, a plenty big uh, team to run, but compared to many other companies uh, in, uh, in the Valley and around the world, it, that is not a big design team. Um, there are literally thousands at, face, at Facebook and literally fives of thousands at Google. So I sincerely, desperately hope that I never need uh, uh, to run a thousand people design team. So this is not what that is about. This is in the early days of that. Um, and before we talk too much about scaling and growing and, and all that kind of stuff, I, and, and um, if you take anything away from this, then maybe it is that try and not scale. Uh, small is beautiful, uh, big is probably slower, pr definitely more difficult and definitely more work. So uh, I assume none of us are really trying to scale for fun, but if you were, I recommend against it. It is too much work. <laughs> um, so. Looking at these uh, eras or beats or years at my time at Stripe, um, I'll try and, and make some sense of it. And maybe you can recognize your, your own experience or the, the, own, the place that you're at with your team or your company right now and, and, and hopefully get uh, one or two helpful pieces uh, of advice. And I should say I aim for this to be um, sort of extremely practical and, and useful. It is not a, it's, there's not a lot of uh, philosophizing or anything like that. This is about like tactical advice for things to do. Um, and it all started in the start, uh, the first year uh, I was at Stripe. Um, I arrived and there were four de designers there. Uh, one of them, Ben Schimmel, is sitting right there. So I will uh, be on my best behavior. Um, and, and after getting started, uh, you know, I think I, I, I figured out that my challenge there was taking uh, the four individuals, uh, who are all very talented designers, uh, but wasn't quite a team yet, and making a team out of individuals. So with that sort of framing, I started thinking about what we could do. Um, and when in doubt, at a meeting, uh, <laughs> which is <laughs> a favorite thing uh, of mine, of course, not only just because sitting in a room is wonderful, um, but also, and not only just because you get work done in a, in a, in a meeting, uh, it turns out that engineering ways for which to have people spend time together on any sort of practical format is really uh, just incredibly useful people who work together, who talk together, uh, who uh, discuss things. Uh, they can't help but form a bond, and that that bond is the beginning of of creating that team. The uh, we didn't do anything super advanced. We we started uh, doing a, a Monday morning, um, a weekly uh, sort of kickoff of the week. All the usual stuff going around the room, talking about what we're working on, what's hard, what's uh, what we're looking forward to, uh, milestones, launches, celebrations, all that kind of stuff. Um, the trick for that particular one is to make it really brief and really painful, otherwise it gets boring really quick. So if you do that, it's an extremely, I believe, useful tool. Um, we added a design review on Thursday mornings, uh, literally going through everything that's going uh, on in the team, everyone showing work, uh, where they are in the, in, in the process, whether they're finishing or starting or they're stuck or they're happy or sad about their work. Um, if we don't have time to go into details in the design review, we did uh, design critiques, 
which are 30 minute blocks of time, uh, each dedicated to a specific project uh, with myself and the designer and some of the design team and the project team and really dedicate those 30 minutes to see if we can poke holes in the design, see if we can find ways in which it's not, with, see if we can understand what the designer is doing and then uh, judging whether we believe that they're achieving that. Um, and lastly, probably the most important sort of meeting tool is the one-on-one, -on -one, which hopefully we all do at least reasonably regularly. And, and if not, I, I must encourage you to do that uh, extremely regularly. It's the most important and, and, and useful tool as a meeting that, that we have. I think not just with managers and the people that work for them, but also between people on the team. Sort of having a, a recurring excuse to uh, to either pour your heart out or just give an update on, on what is going on. Um, and then I wanted to, to, to think about creating a culture of sharing and, and collaboration. All, most of that is maybe sort of delivered by various meetings and whatnot, but it's, I think it's, as a principle, it is just incredibly important. Design is a, is a team sport, and I, I think you cannot complete a piece of design work unless you have shared it with someone else, try to explain to them what you're trying to do, and them telling you whether they think you are uh, achieving it. Um, and, and I also think the, uh, you're not like really truly a team until you can uh, trust each other enough to, to sort of be vulnerable and open and ask for feedback and ask for critique and ask for help. Uh, so, so whatever you can do to engender that, uh, I think is really important. We use a, a tool called Wake, W-A-K-E, Wake. Uh, where we upload all our stuff, every, all designers do that every day. Um, uh, and it sort of creates like a Pinterest type uh, masonry uh, layout and everyone can see whatever is going on uh, on the design team. That's everyone on the team and everyone in the company. So sharing the work often and early. We have a, we have a big wall and a big plotter. We print our, most of the work in a like really nice big format and, and put it up on the wall. It's great for designer X walking by, have never seen that piece of work before. Uh, they see it big and beautiful on the wall. It's great for people who are not designers who get to see what's happening on the team and, and get an understanding of uh, both where the product is going or the marketing is going or, or you know, what, is, uh, what is generally happening. So whatever, whatever needs to happen there to, to create this culture of sharing and collaboration. Um, a third thing that I found important in the beginning is to, uh, to think about predictable processes. And that sounds super interesting, I know. Um, uh, it was to me, at least. Um, uh, another foundational part of being a team, I think, is that, uh, that you're uh, reliable to work with, not on an, only on an individual basis, but as a team as well. It means that um, people outside the team, people who need to work with your team, need to be able to understand how to work with your team. You can't rely, certainly in a scaling environment, you can't rely on you knowing these people sort of socially in the company or... Uh, because it, the team is growing, like you will not know the next person who needs some, some, something from you. Um, so finding, finding ways of having a really good intake point to the design team I found was really uh, important. So people had a simple way of asking for help or asking for work on a project. Um, and they had a, we, we had a, an understanding of when they would hear back from us and how they would receive the work, all that kind of stuff, like sort of operational stuff, um, which I think if that part is working really well, then you can focus on all the, the sort of more difficult problems with this, the sharing and, uh, uh, and uh, getting the creative work really, really uh, into, good, um, into good place. Um, which will lead me to sort of each of these slides have a pro tip in the bottom right hand corner. My pro tip here is to hire a producer. Um, they will literally help with all of these things. And if you don't know what a producer is, it's, it's, um, it started in agency world and then it made its way into Apple. Apple world and now most of, uh, if not all companies that I know of, at least in the Valley, have a producer. It's, a, it's essentially a creative project manager. Um, so, so they help designers and heads of design work on all the things they either can't do, um, don't want to do, or not interested in doing, or not really, you know, don't have the skills to. So that is scheduling. Uh, and I don't mean they're not personal assistants for anyone's, but it's like resource allocation, figuring out when this designer is done with that thing, they need to work on this thing, but actually that's on hold because of the lawyers have said something or whatever. It's a big puzzle to keep that going all the time. And they act as sort of the extended eyes and ears of the, uh, in my case, the head of design, right, to figure out what's going on in the rest of the company. They help spot uh, projects that could use help from the design team. And crucially, they are very good at saying no when, uh, you know, 
a bunch of things come into the design team that we either can't or shouldn't or won't be working on. It's a, it's a great resource for that. So uh, pro tip number one, hire a producer. Um, so that takes us uh, through the first year where we basically didn't hire anyone. Maybe the producer uh, I think we hired uh, in that time. Um, but we spent all of the time uh, putting the foundation in place. And I, that was uh, mostly on purpose, if not entirely on purpose, which I really wasn't super comfortable adding more people to a system that wasn't stable, uh, to a foundation that, didn't, that really hadn't proved itself to work yet. So instead of, and believe you me, like everyone wanted me to hire all the time, but I was like, well, what are they going to work on? Like, how are we going to add them to the team? How are we going to interview them? We didn't know all of these things, so, so I didn't want to just like YOLO uh, add someone. Um, but spending the first year getting all the foundation in place, it allowed us to grow, in fact, to triple in, 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 in the second year from four to, to 12 people. And you can see my inept color coding here. It means that what I'm trying to say is that um, uh, going from a team of generalists, everyone working on everything, starting to introduce specialists. So hire people who only work on product design, hire people who only work on brand design, and, and being OK with that, because that also changes the process. You can't just. Everyone can't be assigned to work on everything. So, so, um, uh, so the challenge I, I think I figured out here was to go from a team of generalists uh, with some structure in place to having more specialization and more predictable uh, sub-teams. Um, one of the things uh, that I managed to focus on or tried to focus on was to not forget about the work. So hiring, the tripling from four to 12, that's a shit ton of work. And uh, you know, plenty of meetings and plenty of interviews and plenty of this and plenty of that. And there's a lot of drama and process in scaling. And it's all too easy to forget about the work, the creative work, the product work that you actually are there to do, not only me, but the, the team, of course. So um, I've uh, quite often had to like sort of uh, sort of pinch myself, wake myself up, and remember it's not only about all of this uh, processy stuff, it's actually about the design work. That's the reason we're doing this. So, so this is kind of my uh, uh, one, one thing to, to, to think about. Um, another thing that I sort of figured out could be a potentially interesting idea was to find a way to let the team help run the team. Um, and what that means was, like again, while the work was important, there's more than pushing pixels that go in to, to running a design team. You have to figure out how you recruit an interview. Uh, you have to figure out how, um, how we're going to do creative reviews or, or design crits and whatnot. We have to figure out how to plan the offsite. We have to figure out how to communicate our process and, our, and whatever happens to the rest of the company. And all of these are sort of, uh, if you don't do them, nothing will like there won't be like a big reminder. You have to figure out how to plan offsites. You have to f a remember that yourself and figure that out yourself. And nothing will really truly go wrong in the short term if you don't do it. But you are not setting yourself up for the next uh, for the next step. So what we uh, what I figured out is that a that was way too much just for me to think about. And b I didn't feel like super competent enough to to decide on the process and the work in all these different areas. So I, I really wanted the team's help uh, on, on both of those accounts. So what we ended up doing was arranging these, uh, I call them on-site off-sites. So basically scheduling three, four hours on a Friday morning or a Friday afternoon with the whole team and doing brainstorms, um, gathering around the table in the design studio um, or in a room or what have you. And myself and a couple of volunteers would help prepare the, the, um, the prompts for the brainstorm. Uh, you know, what are, the, for instance, for the recruiting brainstorm, what are skills we want to interview for? And for the offsite, what are locations that we could go to? Like, both like super high level stuff and super practical stuff. Um, and we did that uh, throughout the year, about once a month, did, did a bunch of, uh, did a bunch of uh, these uh, Friday sessions, we ended up calling them, and making like really good progress uh, on a bunch of these uh, programs without me having to. A, do all the work, and B, make all the decision, um, decisions. I think that was, uh, that was really useful. So, so think about how you can do that. Um, in fact, one specific uh, Friday session we did was uh, sketching out what the future organization of the design team should be. Well, we could, they can be anything. There's no, there's no like law of nature or, or rule of law that says that 
it has to be a specific way and many companies do it many different ways. We could, for instance, be embedded. We could not have a design team. They could all work for the engineering team or for the marketing team. Um, that's one way that I didn't like but, and no one else liked it, so we didn't choose that. Um, but we spent one of these sessions uh, like basically uh, sketching out sort of a skeleton org. Like if we, what, what we can see, the amount of work coming down the pipeline and the kind of team that we want to run, how do we, the current team, how do we want that team to be? Um, and which was uh, really useful uh, insofar as it, A, um, again, got all the work done, but also uh, I think extremely crucially, um, it helped because everyone participated in the decision. Um, they are automatically more on board with the decision, which is really helpful. It turns out a lot of what's difficult about sort of management stuff and running and uh, team stuff is to get people to agree or at least not oppose ideas a lot of the time. And involving uh, uh, people in the decision making uh, ensures that, that, that's, that you have to spend less time on that. So, so that was uh, really important. And then of course we had like, like a, some sort of mythical uh, organization that we could start filling out. So when we knew what to recruit for. So, so that was that. Um, my pro tip for this sort of era, this sort of year, was to do um, team-wide retrospective for the whole year. So what we did, this was confusingly an offsite offsite. So we we found uh, uh, we found an Airbnb a couple of hours north of San Francisco and, and took the whole design team there and spent a, um, a day and a half, and mostly spending uh, the time on doing a retrospective of the year which is you probably do those in some form or on this exact form. It's again very straightforward, very simple, and I, and I found in, incredibly uh, useful. We, and the, the, uh, the, the structure is simple. First you make a list of all the things that you as a team or uh, you as individuals worked on throughout the year. So we did the launch for this, we did the product for that, we did the logo for this, and we made this brochure or whatever we do. So, so literally just fill like a whole wall of, uh, of those big uh, uh, pieces of paper with that. And then, thinking of all the things that we did that year, we think about what, which things went well, not just which project, but which part of the project, or the copywriting was really great here, or the content strategy was really great there, um, or the new logo for that particular thing was amazing. So you make a long list of that, things that went well, and then of course you make a hopefully short, but probably realistically pretty long list of things that didn't go well. Like, we couldn't get the content from the marketing team for this thing, and. Uh, the localization team, team was difficult to work with or whatever you have like everything that was like it's, it's not like you had a it's not uh, you don't need to be in a physical fight with someone for something to go wrong but just like oh I wish this this particular part would have gone better I think that's really useful to know as well and then the true magic comes at with in all the discussion that happens around that and then uh, making further lists so making a list of what you should start doing um, for instance, we talked about recruiting. We should really start screening candidates before we bring them on site. We need to like do a better, uh, you know, we do, need to do a, a better screening on a phone call or in person, for instance. So that's a long list of things we should start doing that we're not doing today. And conversely, a long list of things we should uh, we should stop doing. I, for instance, I remember we we decided we should stop doing random stickers and T-shirts for random teams in the company. It's like like no one has any fun doing that and and people just ask for it like once per week. It's like takes too much time. So let's stop doing a thing like that. And then thirdly, I think too, a very important thing to continue to do, uh, which is again very easy when you're, if you're all very focused on the process and all this uh, stuff, uh, it's very easy to forget what's already working. And I think it's very uh, crucially important to make sure that you keep doing that. Uh, so I think one example was design reviews. Yeah, let's, let's keep design reviews. Okay, great, let's do that. So a long list of that. Pro tip number two. Um, so that takes us through the second year into uh, about uh, the third year. So remember the skeleton orc that we sort of sketched out before? We started filling that out, yeah. as it were. Um, these are illustrating the design operations team, which is the producers, uh, communication design, brand design, product design, and UX research. <laughs> um, so we were, we, uh, using all of the foundation, all the structure we put in place the year before, we were, we were able to, um, to uh, sort of, not exactly seamlessly, but, but rather frictionlessly uh, start building out the team that we wanted, uh, which meant it was sort of time to make recruiting uh, work like a machine, uh, I think, uh, because we, you know, we had a team that knew how to work uh, inside itself, 
and we had a, the team knew how to work with other teams, um, and we, know, we knew the structure. So now we could just basically do what we were already doing, but even more and even better. So that was sort of the theme, I think, and the challenge of, of the third year. Um, and the first thing we set out to do was literally and actually scripting the entire re recruiting process. So recruiting is, um, is something that if you're scaling a team, obviously you're going to be doing a lot. If it's really time consuming and really toilsome, as we like to say, you will have time to do less. If one candidate takes uh, two hours to sort of process, well, then you can do four or five of them per day. If, it take, if they, one candidate takes 30 minutes to process, you can do four times as many. So literally having a script for the entire recruiting process, and I mean that like literally a script. So if, if someone applies to us, th this is all like basic stuff, but when someone applies to us and, uh, and we feel like we need to reject them, then we have a template that we just like, it's one button and they, we say thank you, but no thank you. When we want to uh, ask someone if they want to come and work for us, we have a template for that. Uh, so it takes 30 seconds to send that email I instead of, hmm, how can we talk about what the design team does? And I wonder, you know, what are the things about Stripe that we should say, et cetera. We don't have to think about that. Just like click the button, send the email. It also means, and this was, you know, remember the Friday sessions that I mentioned before where we talked about which uh, skills we wanted to interview for. We decided, for instance, design sense, uh, collaboration skills, uh, passion for design. Those are examples of, of interviews. Um, and what we did then subsequently in a, in a following Friday session, in fact, is then to spend time on each of those interviews. What, what are questions we want to ask about design sense? So literally end up with, and we did that for every single interview. So literally end up with a list of three to seven to 10 questions that every person on the design team can ask a candidate, so we can take a random person on the design team and say, you're doing a design sense interview in 15 minutes, and they will say, yes, excellent, and then we'll go in, and they will ask those four or five or seven questions, uh, and they don't need to make up something on the fly, they don't need to ask the same random questions that the person before them asked, uh, etc. cetera. It is, it is designed to make sure we figure out the full strengths of the candidate and that we get all the information that we need, and that people don't need to invent a question from, from thin air, which is really hard, I know, uh, I would assume you agree when if you go cold into an interview like holy shit what am I going to talk about um, so taking that kind of work out of it we uh, have a, a rubric we know what we think of uh, as good answers and bad answers for each of those questions so they ask the questions they write down the answer we look at the rubric that that was only good answers that was a great interview or that was mostly good answers but there was a really like a weird thing here so let's uh, think more about that we have a, a strict process for how we decide whether to offer someone or not. Like we, we all meet in a meeting and, um, and spend time looking at, uh, at the, the results of the interviews, et cetera, et cetera. And, and it's for the most part like a, a non-decision. Like all the, all the work has been done for us by the interview framework that we've done. Um, we have templates for how to reply to them if we're gonna reject them. We have templates for how to reply to them if we're gonna offer them and, and what happens next. Should they talk to someone in finance or legal or whatever? Like all of that is taken care of, which means that it's, uh, it's sort of a no-brainer to, uh, to interview now. Uh, we, uh, it means that we can move incredibly fast, which is incredibly important in recruiting, especially, well, I think everywhere, but certainly we're feeling it in, in, in San Francisco. People have offers from everywhere, like in two days and whatnot. And, and, but we can literally, like we could probably or actually arrange an interview on the same day if someone somehow came to us at 8 a.m. in the morning and said, I want to interview with you today. We could get that up and going by, by 10 a.m. It's not a problem. Um, so huge leverage in making sure you know literally everything that goes into the recruiting process so you don't have to think about it. Um, what then happens a lot, and we're all, I think, guilty of it, and I certainly am too, is that when we try and make this a machine, we try and look for flaws. It's very easy uh, to find flaws in uh, someone's resume or someone's presentation or someone's one interview answer or education or what have you and, and all too easy to overlook their strengths. So remember we spend all this time figuring out what should the skeleton orc for the, what should the orc for the team be and if we've at some point decided that we wanted someone who's really good at this particular thing uh, and we don't care about this particular thing, well then our recruiting process have to fulfill on that promise too. So if we discover that we think that they're really good at this, but not so good at that, then we have to uh, say, well, we actually don't care about that. They're not, we can either work with them on this thing or we just don't care about it. They don't need to work on, on whatever that skill is. 
and then follow through on that. Uh, it's more, more, um, uh, more difficult to do in real life than, than it is to say on a slide, but I think it's really important. And it also helps build a more diverse team, uh, uh, diverse in all sorts of uh, ways, um, which I think is another self-evidently important thing. Uh, this is almost a pro tip, but it's kind of also cheating. Get a dedicated recruiter. This is uh, something that is extremely more easily said than it is done. Um, I, I, I don't have any, I can't tell the recruiting team to give me a recruiter. I can only, I can only back them. Uh, so I did. Uh, so, um, so, so we got one. And, and um, because even with a scripted recruiting process, there is a ton of work that goes into this. And of course, recruiters are better at recruiting than I am and then probably than you are. Um, and I think recruiters are really good at uh, selling the company and selling the financials, you know, the compensation and the stock price and all that kind of stuff and the benefits. I, I don't know uh, enough about that, I, but I do know what it's like to work on a team. I do know what we need on a team. I do know what, uh, what, um, uh, what the opportunity for the person on the team is. So the sort of combination of a, of a recruiter uh, who is the dedicated contact person for the candidate and, and me or another hiring manager who's sort of the voice of the team is a really strong combination. So something not particularly uh, or not only uh, recruiting related is something uh, I call design operating groups. So remember, I talked a lot about these Friday sessions and, and how we did, uh, did those month over month, which was great. Uh, it, we made some like really sort of signature progress on on these big ticket items on on recruiting and reviewing and, and what have you um, but we didn't it wasn't sustained progress really it was like in February we did this thing and in March we did this other thing but there wasn't like a trickle of work so I, I, I sort of decided to formalize this and this I think this is a, a, a true pro, pro tip that I'm really happy I did so we essentially set up um, sort of virtual teams on the teams. We set up one for, in, in, indeed for recruiting, set up one for collaboration with, with the rest of the company. We set up one for uh, design principles, one for tools on the design team, and one for learning and development on the design team. So, so each of those groups, they each had at their, uh, as their responsibility that area that, uh, of their title. And someone, some, some, some person from the team was the main responsible person for, for running a group. So Jody, the producer, she runs the tools operating group. So she and a couple of volunteers, they, they spend time figuring out like, like, how should we work with our Dropbox folders and our Google Drive folders and, our, and Wake and Abstract and Framer and all that kind of stuff. They buy, if we need to buy licenses for Framer, they take care of that. If we need to buy a new font for whatever, they take care of that. They, they take care of the, of the interior design of the design studio. Uh, that's their responsibility. Uh, Annie, the, who runs the learning uh, operating group, uh, she is responsible for onboarding new designers. Well, not for doing it, but for deciding how we onboard new designers. And, and Benjamin and Wilson works on the, on the principles operating group, which is, you know, what are our design principles? Uh, how do we evolve them? How do we roll them out? All that kind of stuff. Um, and again, because, uh, because there's so much more that goes into, to, I think, running a team than just getting work done, I think this has been an uh, exceptionally and especially sort of impactful thing to do because we see in all of these individual groups now have literally roadmaps, you know, quarterly planning for what, what they want to get done next and, uh, and, and the rest of the year. And we're just seeing like slow but really steady progress on a bunch of areas, a bunch of, a bunch of things you would never really get around to uh, if, you, if you didn't have a concerted way of doing it. So that was pro tip number three. And it, abbreviates to dogs, which is really funny. I promise you in, in real use that you will get a lot of humor out of that, but you can call it something else. All right. This takes us in, into year four, which is sort of what we're in the middle of now. Um, we are going to be 40 plus people uh, across five-ish teams uh, on, uh, uh, on the team by the end of the year. And Remember the the other things, the other the, the structures that we build already. A, a team that knows how to work together, a team that knows how to work with other teams, a team that knows how to do recru recruiting, a team that has a stable structure um, for you know for how it uh, is structured, and uh, and a team that has that is doing concerted and steady progress on all this sort of uh, uh, processy type stuff is a really to me a really sound foundation to. 
uh, to build on. There's nothing major, I think, that needs to change in order for us to enable us to, to scale to potentially hundreds of people. Although I can see Benjamin sweating over there, and I'm, I am too. I again sincerely hope that we don't have to be hundreds of people, but I think it's sort of my job to make sure that if we have to and if we want to, we can actually get there. So, so this is sort of what I'm in the middle of now, and I can, um, uh, this maybe gets a little bit more practical and a little bit more philosophical. Uh, because, and I'm going to talk about program management again. So the Friday sessions were program management. The design operating groups were in our program management. I think it's time to, to sort of get super serious about program management, which means doing all of that, but hiring people to be responsible for it. So, it, so, it, so it's not any who leads the user research team. That is also not her responsibility to figure out how we onboard designers. Like both of those things are like actual real jobs. And she is a researcher, so she should do research. So we should, we should find someone who is uh, really good at and, and really and knows how to do, um, uh, to do designer onboarding, for instance. Um, and that means you know, more producers, more, more uh, design program management people. So I think by the end of the year, I think this will be in place and, and we'll live happily ever after. Um, the most important thing and the thing I'm most imp uh, uh, excited about that, that sort of being serious about program management will, will give us is for us to be able to focus on designer or design team uh, career development, which is, I don't know about anyone here, but for me, that has been the continuously the most difficult thing to do and to do well across my entire career of, of, of managing designers. Um, I think I also personally suck at it. I, don't know, I just want to do what I'm doing and I want to keep doing that and you know, that's great. And I think a lot of the designers uh, that, that I have worked with, you know, it's sort of the same, right? Um, but I don't think that's good enough. That's not a good enough answer. The, the, and the reason why I'm super excited and I think it, 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 it's so important is that, that it's really helpful on a number of fronts. Uh, designers who are uh, growing and learning, they will probably uh, do better work. So there we go, that's already a really tangible benefit to it. Um, designers who are growing and learning are probably much less likely to want to leave or quit the company because they're busy learning and growing. Like why would they entertain the, the millions of inbound emails they get from other companies? And I think, uh, so you keep people around longer, you have a more stable team, you have institutional knowledge, all that kind of stuff. And, and conversely, I think there's people who are not yet on the team, designers who apply, they really want to uh, work on a team that uh, takes learning and growing and development important. So it's a really good sort of uh, attraction for uh, to, to you know to apply to work at Stripe. So it works on all of those fronts. Um, then something like extremely uh, dry and extremely important: deliberate about designer allocation. So I don't know if anyone here can can recognize this. You are probably very tightly scheduled, and probably there are some teams that that are sort of complaining more or less that, well, we don't get any design help, you're blocking us, or can I just get this, uh, the full time of this designer and whatnot, and you should really uh, embed designers, like they should come and sit with the engineers and the product managers and whatnot. Um, and I really strongly, truly think that that is a bad idea, or at least for this time in, in our lives, it's, it's a bad idea. Sending one poor designer out to live among <laughs> engineers and product managers, somewhere, like literally somewhere else in the office, is I think it's just a terrible idea. Design, as I said, design is a team sport. You need like someone, a, a, a kindred spirit to, to sort of work with, um, or you get really alone, and I don't think you get the best work out of it. Um, and, and people who are alone and don't do great work, they, they quit, because why, why would they stay around? They want to do great work and not be alone. So there you go, it's like a huge attrition factor. And it also, it makes it, uh, difficult to, to keep the design language the same and all that kind of stuff. Um, so, so sort of what we are working on now is a, is a hybrid model, which I, th which I think works, uh, or at least it hasn't proven itself to not work yet. Um, on one hand, and this is, uh, we're piloting this on the, on the product design team. On one hand, we have a team that we call the studio team. So those team, the, the people on that team, they work on everything that comes in. The producer and the head of product design is triaging and figuring out, or rather, actually they have a manager now, the head of the studio. Um, they, uh, they're triaging, figuring out what's important to work on, like if we do this first, we can do this afterwards. So they work on everything that comes in. And then, conversely, there's a team that's called the dedicated team. 
So one de on the designers on the dedicated team, they only work on one project with one product team, um, but they spend at least four days a week with the, the rest of the design team, like business as usual. They go to all the team meetings of, of that team, they, and they probably spend one day a week sitting over there with them. Uh, but it's, it's the best of, best of both worlds. Um, so designer allocation and the embedding versus uh, dedicated versus studio model, all that kind of stuff, I think that's something to at least make a very conscious decision about. Um, all right, last pro tip, uh, which is sort of <laughs> Extremely, I guess, personal for myself. The with uh, with the with the team that we have now, which is uh, getting reasonably sizable, right? I, I either have or will have soon uh, managers to to manage all of the sub teams, which means I won't be managing designers anymore. So I will have to switch, and probably some of you will have to find yourself in that situation as well, from managing a team of designers to do great work on time and under budget and all that wonderful stuff, to managing a team of managers who are in turn either themselves managing managers or managing designers, uh, which I think is a mind shift change that I'm not 100% sure what to do with yet. But, uh, but uh, you know, this is, I guess, uh, my note to self to, to dedicate myself to figure out how, what are the things that need to, to change in the way that, uh, that I run processes like, like all of this? Like how do I do all of this but for the design management team? That's, um, yeah, that's sort of my pro tip. Maybe mainly to myself, but feel free to, to use it. Um, so that takes us basically through today's date. And I know that was a, a shit ton of words and, and, and concepts and content. And uh, I guess maybe, this is, this, maybe a presentation wasn't the best format for all of this. But if you, uh, if you bear with me, I can go over the pro tips again. So get a producer. They will almost quite literally save your life. Um, and if uh, you know, apart from trying to not scale, then that's, I guess that's the other the other thing I want you to take away from this. That function is incredibly important for I think for a, a well-oiled and well-functioning team. Do the team-wide retrospective. I think you cannot. It's impossible to overestimate how important it was in figuring out how to run the team. And again, not just like how do we get this page done, but what's our process for figuring out how we get this page done type stuff. Uh, really important. Uh, Design operating groups, or at least some sort of way where you uh, systematically and methodically work on how the team works. Um, again, I can't overestimate the importance of that. And then lastly, uh, what we were just looking at, dedicate yourself to your managers individually as a, as a team. That's the way for uh, when we get to, to some reasonable scale for someone like me to be valuable and, and, and do anything. And. There's only left to say. <laughs> Thank you. If, uh, if you want me to, to clear anything up I want to talk about or, or challenge any of, any of my, my pro tips, um, I'm Malta at Stripe.com or Malta on Twitter. And I would love to hear from you. I could probably talk about this all day. Um, so yeah. Good yeah. um, it's about the project number four. Uh, does that mean that you're currently managing directly 40 people? No, uh, thankfully not. I am managing, I think, four, 14 people. Uh, so I need a few managers there. No, so I have some managers uh, in place okay. already. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and what do you think is the right ratio of direct management? Um, the, I think uh, the industry standard is uh, seven to eight, eight being maximum. I think um, I'm, I'm talking to a person who runs a big team at Facebook. As she is trying to do uh, one to four, which I think is admirable. I think maybe that's a little low, but who knows? Let's see. Uh, and but speaking from experience, uh, anything more than eight is just not really sustainable. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm a product designer. Uh -huh. uh, I also develop for, or design for uh, an API product. So, um, in our teams, we have a brand marketing design team and a product design team, which should do reports directly to product. Uh -huh. So, I'm actually wondering, how do you, if you're in a, a small and into a product organization, how do you um, advocate for more design patterns if that's not a priority for your organization? 
Oh, it's my, my most feared question of all questions. How do I get my company to care about design? And I've racked my brain in trying to figure out a reasonable answer to it, and I don't have anything. I think you, so I think uh, certainly in my time, uh, Skype cared a lot about design, but I was also like there from the beginning, so it's easy for me to just say like, well, this is how it's gonna be, so, and I'm here. I've been here since day one, so this is gonna be like that. The same, same at, at Audio and, and at, at Stripe, I think, it was, a, it, was not, it was a subconscious decision, but I could clearly see that they cared about it. So I think the only true, the only true way to change it is, to, is for it to come from the top. Um, I am not aware of a, of a calculation that you can plug in some numbers and then you show, here's the ROI on hiring more designers. I think a way to think about it, and it maybe may an argument to use, is um, that there, it is so easy for anyone and everyone to build a company today. You use things like Stripe and, and AWS and literally tomorrow you have a company and you have revenue, which means that there are a ton of companies, which means uh, that what is hard now is not to set up the service, it's hard to stand out, it's hard to be noticed. And I think it is extremely difficult to argue against design being a very important factor in, in becoming noticed and standing out. Like that is, that to me seems like a given that if you want to stand out, you need to be different. If you want to be different, you need to consciously uh, approach that as a design problem, and, and that is a potential solution. Um, I have a follow up question. Though. All right. So, as an API product, a lot of our designs are lacking UI, right? They might be purely tech or code design. Yep. And I'm of the philosophy that designers can contribute there as well. Uh huh. Um, but that's actually a part of some, of some of that. Um, what do you think about that? I mean, I'm sure it's a strike we have similar teams or squads that work purely on technical challenges without any interface involved. Yeah. How do designers get involved there? If at all? Uh, so in a couple of ways, there are some, uh, some parts of the API that, that doesn't have any uh, UI correspondent whatsoever. But we, like if, if we talk about, and everyone talks about API design, I think, and certainly, for instance, coming from our founders and CEO, like they are extremely, well, not as much as they should be or want to be, I think, but they're quite, quite interested in that. Like, like literally we sit in meetings with the executive team and look at what should the uh, variable or the parameter be called. We say, hmm, should it be an underscore or not? I'm not quite sure how would that work like in two years if we want to do this kind of thing. And I mean, I don't speak that much in those meetings other than to say that I don't like underscores or whatever. Um, but then there are the, uh, the more UI facing type things uh, where, where the, the APIs that Stripe provides will also have a, a UI uh, equivalent. Um, and, and there I think the, uh, the API serves uh, two purposes. One is to, to serve as a, like an endpoint for a developer to integrate into their systems and, and bop your uncle. But, and then secondarily to be the building, the foundational building block of a, of a user interface. So if that means that um, in order to do, perform this function, you need to, to do four other calls uh, in order to get some status code returned or whatever, I think that's probably bad API design, but it's also gonna be bad uh, user experience. You're gonna have to wait for those calls to come back and you have to render the page again and whatnot. So, so there's something to, to, to be said there, uh, I think. I think if you look, if one looks hard, I think there is user experience in every single decision that every single person that the company does, and I think that there is a, a large portion of those that the design that design team should uh, lead, and a large portion of those that they should be sort of consulted on. Hi. Um, hello, I'm a front-end developer, and I only know Stripe because of thanks to uh, Benjamin's talk. Yep. And um, That's, my question I, I get that a lot. <laughs> You just said Benjamin was part of the design team, yep. and my question is, uh, what is the frontier, the border between designers and front-end uh, developers in uh, Stripe? Um, the short answer is none. Um, certainly if in, in uh, Benjamin's uh, case and a few other people on the design team, like in fact, all the people who were there when I came were uh, like uh, mini, mini Benjamins, and so far as they were all designing and developing uh, on, the, on the site, on stripe.com. Um, we, we now have such, uh, we have a structure that means that not everyone needs to be able to be like uh, literally probably one of the world's best CSS and JavaScript people in order to work at Stripe. Uh, so, so we can hire people who are, are just great designers and then someone else implement it. I think that is 
a required thing in order to uh, to actually scale because there just aren't enough Benjamins in the world, unfortunately. Um, but but conversely, I think it's uh, uh, the way that that Ben and, and the others worked in uh, on the things that they work on today and they worked on in the beginning is was literally the difference between what Stripe was doing and and the quality of that and what everyone else was trying to do. The fact that you don't have a translation layer uh, between the design and you know the intent and the rendering of the intent is makes all the difference. It can be overcome, probably shall we say 98% with a lot of communication and sitting next to each other. But it's that's that's it's not as great. Uh, but then on the product side, that is all uh, React and uh, and uh, Ember and CoffeeScript and Node and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I think you would Ben would prefer to not work in that kind of uh, nasty world, and and not a lot of designers would. Except we now actually have. Uh, I think all of our uh, design systems team also literally write write code every day. They uh, uh, submit PRs every day. Um, they don't do the full stack thing, but they do. Um, uh, they do the UI components for the for the most part. So I guess we've sort of carried on the tradition in, in a sense. I have a second question. So ah. You have several design system teams? Mm, yeah, not really. Uh, we have one. Uh, the the original, the main uh, design system is called Sail. Uh, that's uh, on the product side of things. And then we're just we're just in the in the beginnings of uh, creating a version of that for the marketing uh, side of things. Uh, they have they serve completely different jobs, so they can't be the same uh, like literally the same system. So, but they're all on the design team. Okay, Excellent. Thank you, so Thank you so much for having me.